Welcome everyone. Um, 3D visualization with the ArcJS API for JavaScript. Um, this is an exciting topic and um, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, have a discussion with you about 3D visualization and the capabilities available in the ArcJS API for JavaScript. Um, let me switch to my thing. Okay, so by way of introduction, my name is Christian Ekinis. I'm a product engineer on the JavaScript API. Uh, I focus mostly on 2D visualization. I, I do dabble in the 3D side a little bit. I like to play around with it, see what I can do when I have some ideas. Um, but if I have any questions, I usually go to Raluca, who also works on the API. Well, that's an introduction. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Raluca. I work as a product engineer on the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, but on the 3D side. So we work from uh, our office in Zurich, Switzerland, and we build the 3D part of the API. And I'm responsible for uh, demos and documentation and blog posts and testing and all these things. Raluca does really awesome visuals and uh, she does good blogs, so I encourage you to, to follow her and, uh, and check out her blogs, because she does a good job, even though she doesn't think she does sometimes. So, um, so this session is all about discovering how to visualize geographic data meaningfully in 3D using uh, JavaScript. And the key word here really is meaningful because you can do so many things um, with 3D, but a lot of times it doesn't make any sense. It just looks cool, it's eye candy, and you wanna make sure that it communicates the message. So when we talk about data visualization, it doesn't matter if it's 3D or 2D, the number one thing you gotta think about is your audience. Think about what the message is and how, what's being communicated. Um, and so as long as you're seeking for the best uh, possible communication, then you'll probably do okay. There's a lot of options available out there, but I just wanna um, stress this that just because we have a good visualization API doesn't mean that it only makes good visualizations. There's a lot of awful stuff out there that you can create in 3D and 2D for that matter. So in this session, we're going to um, show you a number of apps, such as this one that Raluca did on world population. So it goes from the thematic side of visualizing to um, some real world data, but also applying um, kind of a different technique here. So we're gonna show you this earthquakes visualization and also the conceptual visualization. So these are also very practical real world examples, but uh, you can create these really nice uh, visualizations using things like the sketches that we, uh, the sketch, sketch edges that we provide in the API. Um, so Raluca's gonna cover those, those uh, apps. I'm going to show you smart mapping and how you can create some thematic data visualizations that may or may not work. And if you have uh, questions or maybe even problems with the visualizations, by all means bring it up. It's, it's great to have a discussion about it. And so we're gonna talk about each of these scenarios. So we're gonna first start off with the visualization basics with the API, and then we're gonna dive into these use cases. How did we create these, these visualizations? Why do we think it works? And what are the things that we still think don't really work very well with them? And then we're going to, well, th we're gonna mix this up a little bit. So it says symbols and renders here at the end. We're actually gonna cover this uh, towards the beginning because we feel it makes sense to get that um, overview um, up front and out of the way so we can focus on, on the exciting stuff. So, in the JavaScript API, we have a set of symbols that are available to you. If you're familiar with the 2D symbology, um, there are things like simple marker symbol or simple line symbol, fill symbols. Um, those you can kind of use interchangeably a lot. Um, what I mean by that is that for polygon data, you can apply uh, simple marker symbols or simple fill symbols on those to, to render your data. In 3D, uh, it, the symbology API is a little more complex, it's a little more complicated than 2D, but I also think it makes sense in a lot of ways, and, and here's why. Um, 
the fundamental symbol classes of the API are point symbol 3D, line symbol 3D, polygon symbol 3D, and there's also um, mesh symbol 3D, which I'll show in another slide. And you, and there's certain rules for, for which types of symbol layers you can use. And so the idea behind this is that you have a, a symbol object, and then within the object you can, you can create symbol layers. So that allows you to define complex symbology. The vast majority of the time, it's most advisable to just use one symbol layer because of that point I brought up at the beginning. What makes sense? What can you communicate easily with your users? But there may be some innovative things you can do with multiples. So you'll see that each of these support essentially two symbol layer types, depending on your geometry. The one exception is polygon symbol 3D because you can render centroids with icons or the object symbol 3D layer. So uh, we've, in this graphic, you can see that there's um, two types. One is flat symbol layers, so think of this as your 2D symbol. Icons, lines, fills. Uh, those, uh, and then you also have volumetric symbols. This is like your 3D symbology. So object symbols for points, paths for lines, and extrusions for polygons. Um, the thing to call out here is that sizes are expressed differently between these two. Because we are in a 3D world, the volumetric symbols, whether they're thematic symbols or real world symbols like models, they are gonna always be expressed in real world units. And that can get a little weird at first. Just wanna point that out. So when we look at these symbols and we're defining, oh, we wanna map you know, population. So you see that extrusion with Florida and the southeastern United States in that bottom right corner. Um, that's population, but we're defining those extrusions in thousands of meters. So it's weird to say 30% of the population in poverty, we want the extrusion to be 30,000 meters tall or something like that. So it's a little strange at first, but um, there's reasons for that. Also take note that um, just like 2D, the icons are sized uh, in pixels or points, so screen space. We also have a mesh symbol 3D. This is for the case with scene layers. So if you have buildings, we're gonna show you a few building demos. You're gonna always apply the mesh symbol 3D. So when it comes to 3D viz, just remember, the symbol type always matches your layer geometry type. That's not always the case with 2D, so that's what's nice about 3D. The three renders we support in 3D are simple render, unique value, and class breaks. Think of simple render as you apply the same symbol across the board, whether it's satellites like this image or buildings with textures or whatever, that's gonna be the same. Unique value renderer, think of it as types. So in this particular image, you see points of interest in your city. So um, that's a type of landmark. Museums, restaurants, churches, hotels. You're gonna set a, a unique symbol to a particular string value in your service. Class breaks render, that's visualizing how much of something exists. In this case, it's buildings and I believe the year in which they were built. And uh, so, we, you define breaks in this, in this class. You say if it's built between 1900 and 1925, we're gonna color it blue. If it's uh, 1925 to 1950, it's gonna be a darker blue, and so on and so forth. So those are the three main renders available to you. What is coming up, uh, what makes visualizations particularly fun, exciting, powerful, are the multivariate ones with visual variables. And these are the things that show, uh, the visual variables show you continuous uh, ramp. So most of the time with 3D, it's gonna be with color. And the reason why I say most of the time is because the size variable is usually reserved for the real world. If you have a tree, you're gonna visualize that tree with, using size based on the height of that tree, probably not by some other attribute. If you have a building, that's a scene layer, there is no size to scale it with. It's gonna just be, that's, that's cooked into the data itself. So you're gonna apply color to that building if you're gonna do some kind of thematic visualization. The one case where, where size can be more dynamic is with extrusions of polygons. And so that could be either building footprints where you set maybe the building height, or you could get a little more whimsical with, with thematic data such as population or some other demographic attribute. 
But you also have opacity and rotation variables that allow you to, to show your data in different ways, such as wind direction, or it could be um, some other direction of flow. And opacity um, is, is a nice way to de-emphasize features. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Raluca. Thank you, Christian. So we're going to look at how to actually apply these renders and symbols that Christian talked about. And I just have some small code snippets that um, also show you exactly like what's the structure, what's the uh, hierarchy here. So you have a layer, uh, let's say a feature layer, and on the layer you apply a renderer and the renderer should have a symbol that will then be applied to each graphic um, or to each feature in your feature layer. Uh, additionally, in 3D, we also have this concept of symbol layers. So uh, you can have multiple symbol layers inside of a symbol. Uh, in this example, I have a point symbol 3D, so if your geometry is a point, you can apply a point symbol 3D uh, with an icon symbol 3D layer. Um, yeah, the point symbol 3D, for example, you could also apply it to a polygon, so it, it's not really uh, specific to the geometry. Um, you can search in the documentation and all these things um, are written there. Then another thing that you can apply on the render is visual variables. So exactly what uh, Christian spoke about in his last slide, uh, you can have, um, you can scale your features uh, using the size visual variable based on a field and, um, or you could map the colors, for example, a color, um, you can map colors to an attribute that you have in your, in your feature layer. And this goes then directly on the renderer. Um, the way you could pass in these fields on renderers and visual variables is either by using uh, a field. I mean, how do you pass these attributes? You can either use directly the field, the, the, uh, the name of the field, or you can pass in an arcade expression. Uh, if you want to, for example, use several fields, like calculate some new value based on the attribute data that you already have. And an important property in 3D that also lives on the layer is uh, the elevation information. So in this case, um, you have a mode uh, that lives on the elevation info, and there are several modes. So uh, you could have relative to ground, which basically means it will align, let's think about points, it will align your points to um, the ground, so to the terrain. You can have relative to scene, which aligns your points to uh, building scene layer or integrated mesh and to ground, depending which one is higher. Or you could have an absolute height. If your points come with set values, then uh, these set values will be used and um, everything else is disregarded. So for example, you could have points inside of a building if that set value is below the maximum height of the building. Another uh, mode is on the ground. You can see it in the image below on the left. Um, that basically drapes your, uh, your graphics on the ground. So it creates an image and it, it will just be draped on the terrain. Um, another important um, information that you could set on a feature layer is um, if you, if you want to label your features, then it's labeling info. And this is again uh, a symbol type, so you have to create a lab label symbol 3D where you pass in a text symbol layer. So this is a bit like the structure of how things work if you wanna uh, use renders and symbols. And now we're going to move on to some uh, demos, so like hands-on use cases where you'll see all this in action. Um, the first thing that I wanna start with is uh, an example about how to visualize world population. And I'm going to take you through um, I'm going to start with like a basic scene. I have the rest of the code is uh, commented out. So what I'm doing here is um, creating a feature layer and which is, oh, I'm just going to show you actually what it looks like in the beginning. So this way it's clear. Oops. Even more, can you guys see my, 
my code here or should I make it even larger? Cool. All right, so this is what I have here. It's a simple globe and I have this graticule. Oops, this is the code, okay. I have the Graticule here. Um, it's just a feature layer with uh, some lines I generated in Pro and then published it as a feature service. Uh, the map contains the layers and the ground. Uh, I don't have elevation here. I'm just passing a surface color. And then I'm creating a scene view to visualize all this where I'm passing in the map, the container. I have a camera position. Uh, this is a property that I'm using so that the background is not um, it allows the background to, to not be visible. So here I'm setting the opacity to zero. Um, I'm, I will explain afterwards in another example why I'm doing this. Um, I, want to, I want to have this nice shadow over here and this allows me, this is actually a CSS shadow, so it's a bit of a trick, but I'll show you guys uh, with my last example why I do this. I think it looks kind of cool. <laughs> um, I'm disabling the atmosphere. So this is one thing in 3D when you wanna create this, these kind of thematic visualizations, you kind of step away from uh, the realistic visualizations that you sometimes have, and then uh, you want to disable, you can disable the atmosphere. Um, I'm disabling also the ambient occlusion or stars or things like this, just to make it look um, as abstract as possible and just to make your data stand out. All right, and here I'm just passing in a few things because I wanna have shadows and uh, I'm passing in the date. I'll show you in the next example how you can actually avoid this by creating your web scene directly in the scene view and loading it in so that you don't have to actually pass in all this uh, in the code. All right, so let's add my population layer. Um, at first I'll add it without a renderer over here. I'm using Glitch because I found it pretty cool. It, it, um, um, first of all, I can just give you the code like this. I can, uh, you can just go to this link word population.glitch.me and then you can just uh, see it live on your computer. But uh, it's also nice, it updates live. So I'm just trying it out for the first time now to use it in a demo. All right, so I'm creating this feature layer over here, passing in the URL with points. It's basically like a grid. I got the data from, I think it was a NASA uh, service that I'm using. I, I downloaded it as a shapefile and then published it as a feature layer. And um, I'm just adding it the way it is, no render, no nothing. So this is what it, what it looks like. And then the fun part comes in when I start to, to visualize it. So um, I have here a function, get render, and I'm going to uncomment it so I can actually show you what it does. I'll start with this one. So this is a simple render and each point um, has a point symbol 3D with an object symbol 3D layer that is a cube. And I'm scaling this cube. I'm just passing in, uh, passing here the width because I want to scale it using a size visual variable based on the population from the year 2015. So I'm actually using the uh, population uh, data, uh, the attribute to scale my cubes so um, that I can represent it on the, on the height of the cube. And then here with this other size visual variable, I'm just mentioning it, mentioning that uh, width and depth should stay the same as defined in my symbol value. So as defined here in the width. And then another visual variable that I'm applying here is the color visual variable. And I'm basically using the same data. So sometimes in 3D we do this because it's hard to read the height or the color, we, we map the same attribute both on color and on height, and then it gives a much better um, understanding of, uh, to, of see, like you can see patterns much, be much better. It's much more intuitive. And the way I'm mapping it is using these tops over here. So um, basically what this does is um, for a value of zero in my field is assigns a size of 100,000 meters and this color over here, and then it interpolates to the next one, of, of, to the next value of four, 400,000, to the next size and to the next color and so on. So now if I comment out this render, 
I don't know if you already have a visual image of how it should look like, but you're gonna see it in a second. It basically maps the places with uh, um, high population with um, a dark purple and then the lower one, you can see they're not that tall, they're like very tiny cubes and um, I mapped them with yellow. And then you can recognize here China and India um, and this must be probably, is this in Egypt? No. Anyway, my geography is really bad. I don't know what that is. <laughs> right, so this is one way you could, you could uh, visualize population in 3D. Um, another thing that I wanna do is, because this is quite hard to, to read, like what is this right now, is I want when I hover over one of these cubes to actually get um, information about the exact value so um, I wanna also highlight them so that I can see which one I selected. Uh, for this, you can set um, the highlight color. You can set it on the scene view. So like this. And then I also have a piece of code here that adds the highlight. Um, whenever I move the pointer, I'm just gonna uncomment it first so you can see it better. Um, right. Uh, basically, on pointer move, it adds an event listener. Um, it will hit test at that point in my scene, so it will just um, uh, fetch like whatever um, is is whatever graphic is at the point where I have my pointer, and um, it will highlight that graphic. So I'm removing the highlight first, but then I'm applying the highlight. Um, of that graphic that I just uh, received from my hit test. And then I'm also adding to this info um, HTML element, I'm adding the information of what is the exact population um, from the graphics attributes. So now if I go over and hover over one of these, I can see um, the population value which is super useful to get like extra information. All right, this was the first example. Uh, the second one is about visualizing earthquakes. It's not the same as Jan showed, so I'm not using a GeoJSON layer, uh, mainly because I have around 245,000 earthquakes. So um, I had to publish it as a feature layer Again, I have uncommented code. We're gonna build it up together. Uh, the way I built here my scene is different than in the previous example. I'm creating actually a web scene in ArcGIS Online. So if I search for this, you're gonna be able to see my scene. And that's a common pattern. I quite often do this. I create my scene in online and then I load it in the API and that saves me setting the camera or um, enabling shadows or setting a daytime and so on. I can go and do that in the scene viewer. All right, there we go. So this is my basic scene and I can also add the layers that I need in there and I can, I can style them, for example, with the options that the scene viewer gives me and then I just load that scene in the API and I build on top of that. And usually I do this for functionality that is not available in the scene viewer. Okay, so um, I'm loading my scene here using the item ID, and then I'm just creating a scene view, um, passing in the web scene and setting, uh, setting it on an element, um, on an HTML element. I'm setting this padding from the bottom because I have this text over here and I, I want my scene to only be displayed from this text on. Um, highlight options again uh, when I select the, the feature and I don't want to have any UI components so this is why I have this, uh, this property here. And now moving on to the fun stuff, we can add our layer. So um, again, I have a feature layer, I published these, um, um, I think it was, this is from USGS Earth, 
Wix feed and we downloaded all of them between 2008 and 2018 and published them as a feature layer. And then to see them uh, the way, so this is without the renderer now again. They should show up. It's quite, it's quite a lot of them, so it probably takes some time to load. Um, oh, this doesn't work because I also don't have the pop-up template yet. One thing that you see here is exactly what I mentioned before, this elevation info. I'm setting it to absolute height because we actually have set values for the earthquakes. Um, we have the depth of the earthquake and uh, we baked it into the geometry. And one thing I did was just because sometimes you have a hard time understanding like where is that earthquake under the ground, even if I make the ground invisible, I just played around with it and inverted the set value. So it's actually uh, displayed at the height above the ground that it would be at the depth below the ground. And then to exaggerate it, and uh, this is more just fancy 3D visualization, I would say. I also applied an exaggeration, so I multiplied it by seven. And then you can see like all these earthquakes flying out here. But the thing is, um, the higher they are, it means uh, the deeper they were underground. And um, this is what they would look like without any renderer, basically. And now I'm going to um, show you the renderer that I built for these. Um, I'm using a class breaks renderer because I wanted to have to classify my my earthquakes between um, like to have three classes for them. The first one uh, with the ones that have magnitude between 2.5 and 4.3 um, should have a green color and then uh, between 4.3 4, 4 and 7 should have a blue color and then the ones that are really high, I just displayed them in red. And I'm also applying a size visual variable to make, make the ones that, um, that have a higher magnitude to make them a bit bigger. And again, I'm passing in the stops that will interpolate between these two values, like it will interpolate the size. And now let me, let me uncomment this. So now I'm applying the render and you should see this style that I just described before. It's loading kind of slow because it's like 200,000 points. But you get the idea. And you see like a lot of um, patterns here. Like for example, here you have earthquakes that are not that deep and they're also not very strong. So these are between 2.5 and 4.3. And here there are like quite deep earthquakes. I find it interesting in 3D, it helps a lot if you like navigate in the scene and then you can see much better what's going on. Oops, I'm trying to tilt here, help me. And it makes also for a cool visualization. I have to say, I actually made it just for the visualization because I found it nice. <laughs> and then um, I think it, this app could really use a filtering so you can filter based on earthquakes. Uh, the only thing that I added so far is a pop-up template so that you can uh, query these points. And this again, you set the pop-up template on the feature layer. All right, so then you get more information about, uh, about the earthquakes when you click on them. But yeah, definitely some filtering would be useful and uh, also maybe a hovering effect because otherwise it's like kind of hard like to click on these very tiny ones. But like this here, you can get more information. All right, so this was the second example. Um, and third example, it's just a really fun one. It's about um, visualizing your city as a hand-drawn sketch. So again, we're going to start with like a basic scene. Um, 
This time I'm just defining a web scene with a topographic base map. And here I'm going to change the opacity of the ground, but otherwise, so the ground doesn't have any terrain, anything. And then just, uh, just a regular scene view. So it's basically what you see here. And all right, what's the first thing that we should do? We should, this is like switching to a really artistic, let's say visualization of a city. So um, the first thing that I wanna do is change the environment settings. So I'm going to um, apply a background color. Actually, I'm setting it to be transparent. So as you can see here, this is uh, what we call background color in a web scene. It's basically the sky that is not displayed anymore and I have access to the background. So this is just an image that I'm setting here in the background with this kind of like old paper style. Um, disabling stars, disabling atmosphere so that they don't get displayed. Uh, then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the base map and I'm going to set the opacity to zero of the ground. And then it's like magic, you actually don't see anything because <laughs> basically my scene is not there anymore. But I'm going to add this scene layer over here, uh, which has buildings for San Francisco. And I'm setting a render on it, which has um, sketch edges. And I'm also passing in a material color that is very, very transparent so that I can actually see uh, through it and kind of like have still my background is still, still there visible. And this creates this nice effect where you kind of like have a sketch visualization, but then you go around it and you realize that you can, you can, you can move inside of it. And a very, very small detail that I'm not even sure if you guys can see it on the big screen is that um, I have my web scene transparent, but I'm setting, I'm actually setting a filter, uh, a shadow filter, a CSS shadow filter on the view, which actually makes those elements in the view uh, drop a, a shadow. So it's a bit like I'm going to make this bigger. When I, when I turn it on, it's like these, this small line over here drops a shadow and it's like a super fine detail, but it kind of like gives this nice, nice effect. And that was also like for the first globe that I built. Uh, this is like a CSS shadow that you can apply to your scene. This has nothing to do with our API. I just discovered it by accident. And it, it, it gives it this, this kind of like nice effect. <laughs> All right, so this was my last demo. Um, you can basically do this with any city, so you just need to replace these scene layers and then uh, with, with the scene layer from your city and then you'll see how your, your city will look like a sketch. So these were the three use cases that I wanted to talk about and then I'm gonna pass it on to Christian to show you some smart mapping in 3D. Thanks, Rulika, that's awesome. I love the sketch uh, look that, that she's been able to do in a lot of city visualizations. Um, I really like exploring attributes that aren't necessarily, um, you know, real world things like how tall something is or, um, you know, like that involve the physical description of the feature per se. Um, I like taking a look at demographics and scientific data, things like that um, I find uh, particularly fascinating. Um, so this is an example that came up in the slide um, towards the beginning where I just have a look at counties and you kind of, they kind of look like buildings because I'm extruding them, but I'm extruding them by something that would be nonsensical in the real world. It's not a height. Um, that's, that means anything. It's just a, a, a relative height that, that is driven by an attribute. So it's just one example of a bivariate data-driven visualization. So as Raluca pointed out, um, in 3D you have uh, certain things that, uh, 
that can work either for you or against you when it comes to visualization. When it comes to cities, things like the shadows and the atmosphere really give it a nice touch. When it comes to the thematic visualizations, um, those things can be uh, can work against you. So, for example, um, you see the atmosphere is enabled here in the background, and you see the stars. Um, the look of these colors really depends on the background. So, I have a light base map, but I also have a dark atmosphere, and so you can kind of get a different look at. Uh, you can interpret the, the visualization differently depending on how it's tilted. Same goes with the shadows. You'll note that this feature right here, if I don't highlight it, it looks like it has three different colors. Um, but I'm only assigning one color to it, and that's to, it's, in this case, it's the pop percent of the population um, with income less than the poverty level. And if you're, to, if you're a traditional cartographer, that might make you cringe a little bit. And the reason is, is because you cannot match that feature to the legend properly. It's got three different shades to it, but it does for good reason. It doesn't look 3D without, that, without the shadows and without the uh, lighting effect on there. So it's important that we do that, but I just wanna make that very clear is that if you have users who are very picky about that kind of thing, then this may not be the type of visualization for them. Because um, some, for some people, the legend means a whole lot. For me, the legend I look at as a guide. I can kind of look at the features and at the legend, and I'm not gonna take it a one-to-one -one exact uh, thing. I'm not gonna know that this is what this percentage is right off the bat. But I can display that information in the pop-up. Um, I'm gonna make this code a little bigger so you can see it. So all I'm doing here is setting a size visual variable. And again, as I pointed out before, we're using real world units. So in the case of uh, the number of people that live below the poverty level, I'm gonna say at the lowest stop, I'm gonna uh, extrude it by 10,000 meters. And at the largest stop, 150,000 people, it's gonna be uh, by 300,000 meters. Now, Reluca made a good point. Uh, and that point was that a lot of times it's nice to use color and size together for the same attribute. So it's not technically a bivariate visual, it's, it's univariate, it's just one variable, but we're using two visual variables to do it. That's not what's going on here. So that's where I think this visualization um, can fail a little bit, is that it's hard to see what's taller than another feature. So if I'm clicking on these, these I almost said buildings, so that's kind of how it also fails. It's, it looks like buildings. Um, I, I don't really know which one is taller than the other one because of perspective. So if you use color, you can tell um, even features that are far away which ones um, are taller than others because you have the color to guide you. Um, but it also does give you a sense of, of what matters. So the color here is used with percentages and then the uh, height is a total value. So while you see higher percentages in these, these counties right here. You can also tell that they're low population counties, so there, you can expect lots of variation in your data. So I think we have a pretty slick API that allows you to, to set up these visualizations uh, pretty well. Uh, but at the same time, um, coming up with these values involves a lot of trial and error, and that can take a lot of time. It can be kind of irritating, a little annoying sometimes, and Let's, let's face it, sometimes you just do not have the time to do it. And so that's where the smart mapping project came in to play. You may not be a cartographer, even if you are, it's hard to get something just right. And if you have default values, um, they may work against you a little bit. Um, so the idea with smart mapping is, if you have a data set, you don't know exactly what data is there, and you don't know which colors to pick based on your base map, will create an API for you to help you out. So in this particular case, I have a building scene layer of San Francisco, and there's an attribute, and that is the walk time to the nearest transit stop. And I don't know how I wanna visualize it, so I can basically pass the layer, the field name, um, and the base map to this function, create renderer to the smart mapping module, and that will query this layer for stats and it will choose the color scheme based on the base map, and then it will construct a renderer for me in the background and give it back. And then when I get that renderer back, I can apply it directly on the layer. So I can get an app like this, which gives me a default visual that shows that 
um, the, the walk times to these near transit stops. So you can see that these light buildings, that's gotta be where a transit line is passing through because they have shorter transit or shorter walk times to uh, the transit station. Whereas these dark ones, um, it's gonna be much further away. We also have a set of, of sliders that help uh, users explore the data. And so you can create these nice little data exploration apps that allow them to play with it. We also have a set of color themes. So not just high to low, but if you wanna, um, if you have a particular value that means something, say like um, five minutes, I can switch that to five. And then maybe I bump this down to two, and this is around 10 or nine. I can explore the data and, and show areas where, oh, this is, these are really good walk times, so the red areas are the ones that we really need to pay attention to. Or you could even do other things such as centering on a particular value. If, if five is the break point and you wanna focus on, on that, then you can show areas that fall on exactly that number or within some kind of buffer of that value. So within one minute of five minutes, you kind of see these, these areas that hit that. Um, what does that look like in code? So, we have these parameters, so you have your layer, so that's just the scene layer, base map, so that could be the, the web scene base map or something else, and then here's the field name. That's really all there is to it. You just have those three things by default, and you can get back a default visualization. You pass it to this color render creator function, and it will give you back a response object, and you just apply that on your render. That's all there is to it. And then when you hook up the slider, you're just allowing the user to update the visualization on the fly. So it only pings the server once. And if you have a little more time, once you come up with a proper story for your data, you can make it look a little nicer. You don't have to go with the default color schemes. Um, oftentimes, the, the thing I tell people is that you, we, the intention of smart mapping isn't to tell you this is the best possible thing that you can come up with. Um, that's not really what it is. It's we wanna give you good defaults. That's what it's all about. We wanna give you a good starting point and we wanna invite you to explore it, to author it in a particular way. Um, and so you can change the colors and add edges to, to get a nice visualization like this one. Something else that I think is particularly exciting with smart mapping and in particular Arcade is that we can be innovative with what we, uh, with what we can create. So um, last year, uh, well actually the last couple of years, I was exploring with this concept of bivariate choropleth maps. Um, if you, how many of you have cartography backgrounds? Anyone here? Yeah, so this is like, this is something that's been around for, I don't know, probably two or three decades. Um, Cynthia Brewer has done stuff with bivariate choropleths. It's this idea that you have two numeric attributes. So let's, the classic scenario is um, the population that is diagnosed with diabetes and the population that is obese. And then you map those variables to a different color ramp and then you overlay those on top of one another to see potential for a uh, relationship. And, and that's what we've done here in this particular case, and we built, I, when I first prototyped it, I just wrote an arcade expression, and it was this really long one, and once I got it working properly, um, it came out with these really cool visualizations, and so we thought, why not expose this to users, but with a smart API to do it? And in this particular case, um, I had this trees data set. I'm symbolizing with, with these models that we provide out of the box in the API, and I scale them based on the real world sizes. But then I have this ugly UI here that exposes um, all the numeric attributes there. And I don't even know what all these things necessarily mean, like you know, carbon removed, and then there's the uh, width of the crown, but then we could also look at carbon se sequestration and see um, where these attributes agree or disagree with one another. So we see that the large trees have both high um, CO removed and high carbon sequestration, whereas the small ones 
tend to have low CL removed but high carbon sequ sequestration. So you can see interesting patterns or even interesting anomalies like maybe these trees over here. And so you can create these, these data exploration apps that allow users to play with the data, to query it, and to maybe ask questions that they hadn't asked before. And all that's going on in, in this one, again, is, oh, this is a TypeScript one, so let's go ahead and pop it out over here. And I'll blow this up. So create relationship renderer. So I'll show you what the parameters were. They're right here. We have a set of schemes, so this is a particular scheme I, I thought would be interesting to use, um, but um, we have a default scheme that you can use. I just passed in the layer, a reference to my view, the base map, and then whichever fields the user selected and then the number of classes. You could do two, four, or two, three, or four classes across. And then you just pass that to the function and it spits this out. So it's pretty cool. So if I were to change one, um, we get a renderer back. And note that the type, let's look at the type of renderer. This is actually a unique value renderer, um, but each unique value is a different bin or a different cube in that square. So there's 16 of them and we, and we give them specific labels and map the particular symbol to them. And then that, those unique value infos are all determined based on this really long arcade expression that um, is kind of hard to understand when you look at it, but um, that's why we created this function is so you don't have to deal with that. We just do it for you. I actually wrote a blog about this. I can pull up a little later so you can check it out. Um, what makes the relationship visualizations particularly interesting is that they work really well in 3D. Like I mentioned before, the size visual variable doesn't work in this case because buildings already have an inherent real world size. Those trees already have an, a real world size. So if you want to do a bivariate visualization, this is really what you got. And now that we have this released and in the API, you can do something with it. So in this particular case, it's energy and electricity use. And I'm just doing a two by two uh, grid and that way it's kind of, it, it condenses it so it's easier to, to digest. But also note that the number of classes does affect uh, how many um, or how the users interpret it. So this may not be a perfect visualization, but it gives me an interesting peek at my data. Note that you can also play with the legend so you can uh, make it more readable to the user. So it's like, this is a high energy usage, but also has uh, a good energy score. So, um, so you can see some interesting patterns there. Or you can even get a little more uh, abstract. In this case, it's actually three variables. And so this is where we start to tread on that, that really dangerous line of what makes sense and what doesn't. Here, I'm looking at the maximum wait time for public transit in Los Angeles and the percent of the population that's a minority. So if you look back here, this is the UCLA campus. So you see that there, that falls right here in between this longer wait time and, or actually it's a, what this is, is it's a high or a medium minority population, but long wait time for transit. So then you look at downtown Los Angeles and you see lots of minority population and, um, but, but shorter waits for transit. So they have actually good access to the public transit. As you could probably tell, I struggled with a little, a little bit in explaining it. That's why you know, these visualizations may or may not work very well. If, if you have a hard time explaining it, then it's 
then it, then it may not be a proper visual to use um, in your organization. Um, so the legend plays a big role in that. And also the, the size, so the height of the cylinder is also the, um, the total minority population. So we play with all sorts of variables to try to derive meaning from it, but in an interesting, um, visually attractive way. And this is just using the exact same smart mapping API that I just showed you. And we also have others available, such as predominance and age and, and all sorts of others that allow you to um, explore your data using arcade expressions. So with that, I'm gonna, Switch it back over to Raluca. Do you want to show your blog post first? Oh, sure. Because I'll just show resources, so then. Okay, so I actually don't, she has blog. <laughs> I have to search it because uh, relationship. So it's this one. This is actually part of a larger series on smart mapping with Arcade that I did. Um, if you take a look at it, it explains the concept behind this and why we, uh, how we approached it. And it gets very deep into actually the implementation itself. So if you're interested in that and, um, and how it works, like the codes that we use, even the arcade expression, it breaks it down, um, then, by, then I encourage you to read this, this blog. Because um, this also allows you to see how can I create my own um, visualizations for my users. You can be innovative and generate that for them so that you can create custom renders for them. Cool. Thanks, Christian. Yeah. So not much left. Uh, just uh, I wanted to pop up this slide with the resources. Um, the Documentation in the API um, has a bunch of guide topics on visualization, so you can check those out. And then Christian wrote a series of three blogs on 3D visualization techniques. And then um, I have also a bunch of um, blog posts about visualizing data on globes and also this sketch style for cities. So if you're interested to read more, you can um, check out these blog posts. And now before we go into the questions, um, I just wanna ask you to, when you have time to uh, fill up the survey, because we really like the feedback. I personally read all the comments in the feedbacks. All right, so with that, just um, pass it on to questions, pass it on to you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Find suitable colors, but is there thought of doing that with a, in a trivariate way, so like a ternary diagram? So it's sort of emulating the, the subtractive mixing with the CTMY that was done with polygons. Do you know, is there any movement in that direction? Sometimes you can get really interesting stuff out of it, but I know it's difficult because <laughs> I've tried to do it. Yes, so I mean, you kind of answered the question for me a little bit. So the question was, um, have we experimented or thought about uh, color schemes with three color, like a trivariate color scheme? Um, I know Cynthia Brewer has experimented with that a little bit. The, um, I have thought about it. And the reason why I say I is because I think a lot of people are very uh, wary of us going down that road. Um, I've seen some interesting visualizations in ArcGIS Pro where people do their own custom thing and, and do that. Um, but we're not really headed down that way with smart mapping. Um, but it's certainly an interesting topic and you could do it on your own with a custom arcade expression. So um, I, yeah, that's something that I've thought about dabbling in, but it, that's kind of um, borderline crossing the line between understandability and being useful. Limited, limited application. Yeah, and, and then you have very few schemes that actually work. I mean, even in this bivariate color case, you only have like so many that work very well. <laughs> yeah, basically two that work that are colorblind friendly and things like that, yeah. Okay, so um, great question. Um, so 
it's, yeah, this isn't exclusive to 3D. The question is, what are our thoughts on visualizing uncertainty? Um, this is something I've thought about a lot. Um, and I, and now that we have the American Community Survey data that's just been released publicly um, a couple of months ago, this is something I wanna dabble in a little bit because they do provide things like margin of error for all of their attributes. Um, but uh, we don't, we don't really suggest or provide a, a suggested way to do it with the API. It's really up to you. Um, I have looked at, um, I, I've experimented a little with opacity, um, uh, but I haven't really done a whole lot in that space. Do you have anything, Raluca? Not really, no. It's not something that we explored in, in 3D, I guess. Maybe it would be more of a use case for 2D, because in 3D, you already have so much information. I haven't really thought about this, like how to add another thing like uncertainty. I have thought about it in the context of our client-side filtering capabilities. Like uh, you may have seen in the plenary where we uh, demoed visibility filters and then like these effects where we grayscale out things. Like I've thought about it in that space and that's something that I think would be interesting to experiment with. But yeah, that's a very important uh, point to bring up. Uh, was there, yeah. First, thanks for breathing at 1.30 in the morning. One, what? What? <laughs> One thirty. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Population, demo. Right. When you were saying the width, like 80,000, is that just like the resolution of the point? Oh, no, that's in meters. So we have these, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, the resolution, I don't remember exactly the resolution of the data, um, but theoretically, yeah, cause, because then you don't really have too much gaps between those, uh, those um, um, uh, not cylinders, but like uh, cubes. So that's probably quite close to the resolution of the actual data. Yeah, something else I'll show in the last here four minutes that we got. I think you need to switch. Yeah, I will s just hit this. So oh, I didn't update this app. Let's do that. Right. Um, 3D. Is this five? Okay. So I'm just going to go to here. Exact. Oops. Main. Okay, here it is. So um, this this kind of relates to your question here with the resolution. Um, oh, this didn't. Oh, it's because I'm. It's again. I didn't compile this here. Let's do a TSC watch. And there we go. Um, so this is a visualization of marine data. I just took a section of the Indian Ocean surrounding the Maldives, and uh, this was done by Esri. It's called Ecological Marine Units. Um, they provide this data open. You, if you do a Google search, you'll be able to find the links. They give you the pro packages and um, even services where you can bring this in on the web. And so. I'm using the smart mapping APIs to generate renders based on the various attributes they do. So their actual uh, resolution here, they did do a grid. It was uh, 27, uh, was it 27 kilometers by 27 kilometers, I believe. And so here I've done things like, you know, not only salinity, but if you want to do two, then let's do a relationship visualization to see what that looks like because they look at things like salinity and temperature together. And so you see not only how does this uh, look in the 2D space, but vertically in 3D. So it's kind of a cool little way to explore this kind of data. But, yeah. Just wondering, how easy is it to extend this to go into a form like VR? Just a question of a simple profile. 
so, uh, so you said VR? Yeah, so how easy is it to extend this into a VR experience? Um, I know we've uh, experien um, experimented with that before, right, Raluca? I is it on? I actually never turned any of my apps into web VR, so I couldn't really reply this question. Uh, we had an intern that worked on an application, um, turning like a web scene into a VR experience. Um, it took him about three months. <laughs> But um, I cannot really answer that question because I've never done it myself. So and I know our prototype lab has has done that. So um, John Grayson has built apps like that. So, um, but yeah, we don't like provide out of the box VR APIs, things like that, that will make it easy. Any All other right. questions? Well, with that, we'll go ahead and close. And if you have more, just come up and talk to us. Um, and we're here through now, I guess we're done. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks. Thank you.